uh, drug itself um, basically has been developed probably around two decades ago or so. Uh, the principle is that it's a medium chain triglyceride, um, but with an odd number of carbon. So unlike what we can find in regular food, so this is a, a synthetic product. It cannot be, yeah, it cannot be found uh, find in 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 food or or in nature or whatever. Uh, so it needs to be synthesized. But because of its um, structure with this odd number of carbon, basically it provides not only what we call acetyl CoA, which is a substrate that you get from all uh, lipids and sugars and basically feeding uh, your, your cells and the mitochondria. But you get also, besides this acetyl-CoA, uh, what is called propionyl-CoA, so something with a, a three carbon. And this is going to be an intermediate uh, for succinyl-CoA, which is another key uh, intermediate for the, the Krebs cycle. So basically, instead of fueling the Krebs cycle with just one angle like regular food uh, does, this compound allows to enter the Krebs cycle at two levels. And so this is why it's called anaparotic. And so it basically targets specifically the functioning of the Krebs, Krebs cycle. And so it's related to basically energy provision to the cell. Um, so the idea to use uh, this compound came from studies actually done initially. I don't, th there are a lot of preclinical data showing that there is energy deficiency in Huntington disease, but why targeting specifically the Krebs cycle? Well, that came more for actually patients' uh, observation rather than preclinical data. Uh, when we conducted uh, a study um, that was published uh, in 2007, uh, when we conducted a study to look at uh, what was associated with weight loss at the early stage of disease and actually even in what we call the pre-manifest uh, individuals, so people carrying the mutation but who have not yet developed symptoms, we did a, a comprehensive uh, endocrine, immune and metabolic analysis, including metabolomics. So we look at all kinds of uh, metabolites in the blood. And the only thing that could really distinguish the different population of controls versus is patients and patients and pre-manifest were actually a decrease of some amino acids. So usually some compounds of proteins, but those amino acids, acids called the brain chain amino acids. So it's valine, leucine, isoleucine. Uh, these are actually precursors of acetyl-CoA and succinyl-CoA. So exactly the two intermediates I mentioned that triheptanoic in can provide. So the question was that, I mean, the hypothesis was, and maybe it's not just in the brain, it could be also in the periphery because the hunting team is also, of course, expressed in the, in, the, in the peripheral cells, that the body was trying to compensate for an energy deficiency and probably with multiple causes because the hunting team uh, protein is playing a role at very different levels of energy homeostasis. But the one way to compensate was to use those uh, specific amino acids uh, to try to prov uh, provide thrill for the Krebs cycle. And so the idea was to then help basically what the body is doing by giving this uh, synthetic oil in order to fill the cycle just at this uh, two entrance points. So we did a first study uh, initially, um, very shortly. I mean, we, we studied the muscle energy first. So that was also uh, now probably about 10 years ago. So we did uh, uh, an exercise with patients uh, when they have actually to exercise their calf. And there we could measure some phosphorus uh, uh, enriched metabolites that reflect energy metabolism in the muscle. And so we gave them the triheptanoin for a few days. And we saw that in the ones who had an abnormal profile, we had a correct of this, this, is, this profile. So this told us first that, that there could be something on the energy metabolism uh, doing it for this population. Then we switched that protocol to the brain. So we use then the uh, same type of approach, measuring those phosphorus enriched metabolites in the occipital cortex that we stimulated with a flashing checkboard to do a sort of exercise for the brain. And we could see that again, patients had an, an abnormal profile and that after one month of treatment, we could correct that and back to the profile of, of controls. Um, but of course, this is saying that it plays on the energy. It's not saying that it helps the disease in other aspects. And so there, the study then we conducted, and so we already had an idea of tolerance and, and acceptability based on these initial studies, was basically a six months uh, uh, randomized trial where we compared on uh, other aspects of the disease. So especially the atrophy of the codate uh, in, in the brain, which has been shown to be the most sensitive to change in Huntington disease including in the pre-manifest population. And the UHDRS, which is a, 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 um, basically a 
compound score that looks at different aspects of motor function in Huntington disease. And it's a primary in a lot of uh, uh, large trials because you need definitely a lot of patients to show an effect. So we use these two measures mostly to, to see. And so uh, for reasons that it would be too long to explain, uh, we would have liked to do a one-year trial right away because six months is actually pretty short to see an effect on either the CODATE or the UHDRS. Uh, so at six months, uh, we, we, we saw some trends, including for the UHDRS, but not a definite uh, uh, response. And uh, But basically, patient then continued uh, on treatment, but then both arms. So thankfully, we had a concomitant study that we are running exactly at the same time with the same patient population that, of course, we then compare statistically and that were indeed comparable, uh, that we're having the same time of procedures, same number of visits, et cetera, et cetera, but testing another drug. And basically, we use the placebo arm of that uh, other study uh, for one year and compared to a uh, one year uh, of uh, treat, uh, treated group uh, with triheptanoin. And there we actually could see and confirm that what the trend we had on the UHDRS was confirmed that in the triheptanoin treated group, Basically, patients almost didn't change, so they varied of 0.7, which is uh, an, uh, negligible compared to the 2.5, 2.6. Actually, we observe in the uh, uh, the placebo arm, and and this is known actually for a lot of other studies in Huntington that the average increase of UHDRS in one year is 2.5. So we could confirm that in our placebo group, but we saw a stabilization of of that in our uh, triheptanoin treated group. And then when we look at the uh, rate of codec atrophy, basically when we compare this uh, placebo arm to our, our triaptonoid triaptonoid in arm, then we had a 50% decrease. Uh, so it's actually a large uh, uh, reduction of, of this uh, uh, atrophy um, in the code date. And that was highly significant because of uh, not knowing initially how patients will react uh, for one year or more of treatments, because it's still some special drug. It's not something you can just take in a pill. Uh, it's less invasive than gene therapy on the other hand. So in terms of acceptability, actually for patients, it happened to be quite okay. And in the end, actually the patients did the second year extension and then further. So we know actually that this compound, despite needing some uh, diet arrangements is, is really well accepted for a large group of patients. Uh, but because of all this unknown, our study was under power to de definitely see an effect on the UHDRS to start with, because usually you have to have more than 200 patients per arm. We only have 50 so that's, that's way smaller, but still we saw that. So the idea now is to go to phase three, hopefully, uh, and, uh, and, and use the UHDRS as probably a primary, because if we confirm that clinical stabilization, we probably don't need hundreds and hundreds of patients to see it. Probably if we double uh, the size of our cords, we should see it. Maybe a last thing, we don't think that triptanoin is the cure for Huntington disease, but we think it's a, one of the components that can help and uh, definitely on the energy metabolism uh, aspect. And we know that for Huntington and other also neurodegenerative disorders, that this is an important one. So we, we could foresee that this would be one uh, approach together with, with other uh, approaches for this, for this disease in the future.